Welcome. The board will participate in seven meetings today. We will start with the calendar workshop, followed by four closed sessions, workshops, and finally a special meeting. The attorney-client sessions will open and close in the public, but the ses sessions are closed. I'd like to remind all who will be speaking today that this meeting is being transcribed in real time so it can be viewed with closed captioning. Please speak at a reasonable pace so the transcribers can fully capture what you are saying. We will now call on the calendar workshop to order. Mrs. Bass, please take the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Chuck Shaw. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marcia Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. All right, we have quorum with all seven board members present. Also in attendance on the dais is Superintendent Dr. Donald Fanoy and General Counsel Julie Ann Rico. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Ms. Ms. Whitfield. The flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I understand we have several veterans in the room, so thank you very much for your service to our country, and I'm sure we'll be hearing from you shortly. Mr. Dr. Fenoy, it's all yours. We're going to start with speakers. Mr. Chair, start with speakers. Okay, we'll get the speakers first. Yeah. All right, so we have a, a, quite a few speakers that will be speaking today. We have two, two podiums. Uh, call your names uh, two at a time. Uh, three, actually, three at a time. So if you would make sure that you get to one podium or the other so we can keep things moving along. You'll have three minutes if you watch the clock. The only one that gets four minutes is a Colonel and his puppet. So uh, uh, you'll see that in a little while. So I'll start with Representative Emily Slosberg, Representative Tina Polsky, and Ronald Laporte from SEIU. Good morning, Chair Barbieri, school board members. I'm Emily Slosberg. I'm the state representative for House District 91, which runs from Boca up to, Boy up to Boynton Beach. Um, I'm here today because, it, I, and I'll take you back to initially to when I started running for office. The fir one of the first people that I met was Corporal Bruce. I, I went to two J's with Corporal Bruce and his friends. And one of the first issues that he brought to me was having Veterans Day, having off, all students should have off on Veterans Day, making it something statewide, because it really should be. I mean, other states have done it. And so this is a, an issue that is a, incredibly important to the backbone of our country, like Corporal Bruce and our other veterans. Um, so I'm here speaking in favor of having no school, not even a teacher work day, on Veterans Day, because this is something that is celebrated family-wide. You know, the family wants to be together, to be off, and there's no reason we need to have teachers at school on Veterans Day or anybody at, at the school. It should be off. So with that, I would ask that you kindly take that into consideration. Thank you, Representative Slaughter. Representative Polsky. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for hosting this workshop to discuss the important issue of the 2020 school start date. I am very proud to be the state representative for District 81, which covers the areas west of the Turnpike in Boca, Delray, Boynton, Lake Worth, as well as the three cities in the Glades, Bell Glades, South Bay, and Pahokee. In my first term as state representative, I focused on multiple public education issues, including a bill to raise teacher salaries and fighting hard against the very troubling legislation that we face with respect to private school vouchers, bonus structure, and the Guardian program. I am very proud of the small victory we had on the referendum and also to bring back money for West Tech. I worked with many of you throughout the process and I feel confident that I will continue to focus on school issues as I gain more seniority and with that more influence. Now I'm asking you to work with me once again on the school start date. You are looking at many of my constituents and by the way, there's many still waiting in line to get in. So I hope that we can keep this going while they're waiting to get in line to get in here. I'm asking you to work with me once again on the school start date. You are looking at my constituents here who obviously feel very strongly about this problem. I am representing them here 
today, but they will all speak for themselves. I can tell you that my office has been flooded with complaints, but I have not heard from one person who prefers an earlier start date. All we are asking for is a five-day pushback from August 10th to August 17th. This simple fix would make all the difference in the world to these families. Many of us send our children to programs and camps throughout the country. I know we want our children to experience the multitude of options across the country and not just be limited to summer programs in the Southeast that accord with our schedule. The rest of the country is on a different schedule. It is a fact of life in Palm Beach County that many of us are transplants from the Northeast. We grew up at camps there and want our children to have that same experience and want them to attend with friends and family from that area. With school starting the third week in August, we have always managed to make it work. But this change in start date will be a serious problem. There are also children who have attended for years, and now a sudden change in the calendar could require them to stop attending the summer program they know and love. There are also many teachers who work at these camps. We know teachers need to supplement their income, and many work at camps throughout the country, and this would affect them as well. I ask that you remain open to listening to these parents. What they say matters. It may not affect everyone in the district, but I don't know why any parents would prefer the earlier start date. And even if, it is not an, even if this issue is a problem for only a smaller population, it still matters. If it is neutral to the rest of the county, but terribly important to these families, then we need to take that into account and help those that we can. There are the par these are the parents you see before you, you see how much they care, who make up the PTA and volunteer and make the schools in my district fantastic. Please give me another minute. I'll take up Emily's time um, since she didn't finish. You don't want them to have to make the decision if their child will miss the first few days of school because with this new calendar, I'm afraid you will have many kids out the first week. Thank you for keeping an open mind and remaining flexible. We are only talking about a few days, but those few days will make all the difference in the world in enabling these students to attend their summer program of choice, the teachers to be at camps, and be ready for the first day of school. Thank you for your careful consideration. Ronald, Ronald Laporte and Robert Adicott, please come up to the podiums. Good afternoon. My name is Ronald Laporte. I'm a rep for FPSU. I'm here to talk to you today regarding the early starting date also for the workers. The decision that we make here will affect a number of people that will be working for the district. For example, <clears throat> we have 930 bus drivers and bus attendants that will be working. By pushing or shifting the date, the starting date to the 17th, that will affect them and that will make their pay fall behind by two weeks. They already get like four paychecks that they are already missing this, uh, this summer and pushing it to the 17th, that will cost them an extra two weeks. That is for our bus drivers. We have food service work, a food service manager also. They work in 193 days. And uh, there are, are about like 184 of them. The same thing will happen to them also. We have the school food service who work 182 days. About 960 of them will be missing an extra two weeks. That will make it like 10. 10, a, 10 weeks or five paycheck that they will be missing. We have our power of professionals also who work for the district. 1,069 of them by pushing the date to the, to the 17 will causing them to miss an extra two weeks also. The hardship, those are the things that we want you to look at. Every summer they missing eight, eight weeks or four paycheck by adding an extra week that will causing them to push back to two paycheck again that make it like five paycheck. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Atticott. My name is Robert Atticott. I am the president of ASOP. And just like um, my colleague Ronald over here, um, my bargaining unit is affected by um, the uh, later start date, if that is considered. Um, we are looking at over a thousand employees, which is more than half of my um, bargaining unit. 
That includes our community language facilitators, our school monitors, and our paraprofessional ones. These are some of our lowest paid employees in the school district, and missing a paycheck can be financially devastating, especially for some of the employees that are um, heads of household. So I would, um, if you do decide to um, continue and move forward with a later start date, please put in a mechanism that will ensure that they do not miss their paycheck. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Corporal Richards will be next, but before he speaks, would Jim Napoli, Post Commander for Veterans Affairs, please come to the other podium? Uh, if with the board's consent, I, I told Corporal Richards he's got a GI Joe with him, and he wanted three minutes for each, and I told him that we'd give him four minutes. So if, if you have, for the hundreds of hours, he's volunteering in our schools, if you're okay with that. So would you set the clock for four thank minutes? Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for my time. I'm Corporal Bert Richards, and please understand this humble 89-year-old veteran. My comments today are not to be considered disrespectful, but from my research and factual uh, information. The force that appeared before the school board in 2010, myself, Commander Ralph Shearer, Commander Charlie Epstein, who have passed on, would be happy to know that air efforts are still intact with the closing of the Palm Beach School on Veterans Day, November 11th, and for every year there forward. But let's remember that teachers of all ages have families, husbands, brothers, uncles, fathers, grandpas, mothers, sisters, aunts, who served in the military and whose bodies, parts, are still returning home. Every day is Veterans Day, is a day to honor those, and the teachers have a pathway to success, and to deny a teacher time off is shameful. As an elected official supporting public school education in Florida, you should support the teachers as well. Now, were you in attendance of any school graduation and be proud of what you are involved in as commissioners? Well, I hope so. Do you love your country? When you recite the Pledge of Allegiance, you learn it each meaning. It's called patriotism. And I'll bet no one knows on the dais who wrote it. Think about it. Who wrote it? The Pledge of Allegiance. As stated in your superintendent, and I quote, I understand my education has forever changed the life trajectory, and that is why every decision I make as a leader is in the best interest of the children. What is your decision, Superintendent, to have teachers working on Veterans Day as well? I get very passionate about our veterans who only want respect. They never got it for the Korean War and the Vietnam War. What's the big deal to pay teachers on Columbus Day? As a matter of fact, Columbus only discovered us. He didn't fight for us. We have an administration that teaches dishonesty and fraud, and teachers help the students understand morality and the truth in their daily lives. So how can you deny them a day off on a federal holiday? Please marinate your decision for year 2019 and forward. And all due respect for claiming there is not a day that goes by that police and the fire department are honest as first responders, but truly, it's our teachers on the job getting shot and killed to protect students. They're the first responders. Just so you know, June 6th, tomorrow is D-Day, and our veterans were there first, too. Now, I'm going to let Corporal Bert Richards is turning the microphone over to G.I. Joe. I don't think the Education School Board was trying to be mean or not understanding. They might be uninformed as we have some sacred obligations to care for and those we sent to war and those we teach American history. Now think, the President's administration wants to send immigrant children to our state. Who will receive them? Teachers, if he's still in office. Having the children home while they attend school because of pay costs, that's the issue. If it is, kindly consider that teachers get paid for hurricanes, shutdowns, Memorial Day, Martin Luther, President's Day, and more days. And as the records indicate, Florida's teachers' pay is, the, out of 50 states, they're 42nd, and New York City is number one. And in closing, I want to give my appreciation to Carol Bass, the clerk, 
who is respectful and helpful in our hand. Now for the teachers and students on D-Day and Virginia Beach, this is for you. I thank you and respectfully hope you have the right decision for our teachers. Thank you, Colonel. Corporal Richard. <laughs> Would Henry Tucci, American Legion, post 380, come up to the other, other podium? 390, excuse me, post 390. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Napoli. I guess the mic is on, is it? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Tucci. Oh. I'm here representing. American Legion Post 390 of Wellington. Unfortunately, our commander was not able to be here this afternoon. He had other engagements. So I got the duty. And I'm here to reiterate our post feelings on this matter of closing the school on Veterans Day. And we feel very strongly that the school should be closed. I mean, tomorrow's the big day, D-Day. Now they talk about draining the ocean because there's so much still under the ocean. I know you're all aware, a lot of you are in the service, the same as me. But those guys, if it wasn't for them, most of us wouldn't be sitting here today or standing, right? They're the real heroes. What are they dying at, two, three hundred a day? Go down to the honor flight and watch, like I did last week, okay? It's something to see. And myself, for myself, I strongly feel that these kids today, they're not taught history. They should even be taken out to the cemetery, the National Cemetery out here, and watch a funeral. I buried quite a few. You know what it's like to carry even women, wives, carried them to their, to their final resting place. These kids don't know anything. There are some, the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, but overall, it's not being put out there. In another 10, 20 years, I don't know what this country is going to be, seriously. I really, I have five great granddaughters, and my God, I worry about them. I think it's something that you should all consider. It's a solemn day, Veterans Day. It's not a, a day to run around down to Macy's or Lowe's or someplace. Of course, they got a sale. That's a lot of crap. It should be revered as a solemn day to honor the veterans that fought for your freedom. And I'm not going to stand up here and use up three minutes. Bert did a, a hell of a presentation. But... <laughs> I got to tell you, I know some of you are in favor of it and some are not. I'm trying to get to the point where we can sway you people that want to keep the school open. It shouldn't be open. Everybody should be off. The cops, it's a, it's a federal holiday. It should be closed. And that's about all I have to say on that. And God bless you for your thinking and taking care of these kids. Thank you. Thank you. Would all of our veterans in the room please stand be recognized? All of our veterans in the room, please stand. Let's all recognize them by standing, please. The next speakers are Jamie Schisler and Robin Rosser. Would you please come to the podium?
My name is Jamie Schisler, and I'm the mom of two elementary school aged children. I'm here to speak on behalf of the thousands of signatures we've received opposed to starting school four weeks before Labor Day and doing what's in the best interest of our children. First and most importantly, August is the hottest month in Florida. My kids did not have any time outside of their classroom for the entire first month of school last year because the heat index was too high. As a former elementary school teacher, I know recess and movement is an important time for our children for their physical, social, and mental health. ADHD and anxiety is only increasing in children, and they need this mental and physical break. In my children's school, they have physical education one out of every seven days. And for the first month of school, PE had to take place in the classroom because it's too hot outside. I can tell you there's not much physical education happening in the confines of these classrooms of 20 to 25 children. Without a physical and mental break in their day, research has proven that it, is, it makes it harder for kids to focus and do what they have to do in the classroom, and their behavior and academic performance reflects that. So you think it's in the best interest of our children to start school even earlier? I and many other parents had to call the transportation office many days last August because the air conditioning wasn't working on the bus. This creates an unsafe environment for our children. By starting school later in August, we are eliminating time spent in these dangerous conditions. Summer is a time for children and families to travel, play sports, attend college prep programs, attend sleepaway camp. With our calendar in Palm Beach County proposed to start now four weeks before Labor Day, children and families will have no longer be able to attend these activities that are so important to a child's development. Our children spend all year taking tests, reading books, writing papers, doing homework, and learning in a classroom setting. In the summertime, they can actually get out and have hands-on experience about what they're learning about in the classroom. August is a time when businesses are slower, and it's time for parents to take off work and spend time with their children. The earlier and earlier start date puts us more and more out of sync with the majority of the country. A significant amount of children in the Palm Beach County attend sleepaway camps up north, where they have bonded with friends and counselors from other states and other countries and have amazing experience of learning how to be independent and try things they could never try at home. If school starts on August 10th, thousands of students would either not be able to attend these summer programs or they would miss the entire first week of school. I've spoken to many of our hardworking teachers who unfortunately do not earn enough to take their well-deserved break for summer. Many supplement their income with summer employment at these sleepaway camps up north. The proposed start date will no longer allow these teachers these employment opportunities. You are not only affecting the children, but also the teachers. We have heard the reason that school starts so early is because there needs to be 90 days in the semester before winter break. The past school year, there was only 86 before the break. Two years ago, there was only 80 days because we missed days from a hurricane. It seems we are trying to cram 90 days of learning into a calendar that just doesn't fit. Many people are asking how many other states ranked well above us in the nation seem more capable of educating their students without requiring midterms to happen before Christmas break. It's time to change our schedule. We don't need the entire week of Thanksgiving off. This creates a huge burden for working parents. It creates a huge burden for working parents who have to figure out how, what they're going to do with their kids and their daycare. Mrs. Schisler, you need to finish up. I didn't realize you No were. problem. I have t two lines left. Why not add those days back on the calendar to have a later start date? Two weeks and two days off winter break is ridiculous. Some educators will say this is even too much time off and a huge interruption in the school year. If there's not enough time to learn information for the first semester before the break, make the winter break shorter. Have a day or two of review, a week or two of review in January, and then administer finals. Ms. Schisler, you're out of time. I'm Thank sorry, you for we have your a time. Thank you. <laughs> Robin Rosser and Jonathan Burns, please come to the podiums. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to our veterans who are in the room, and they do, do deserve the day off. My name is Robin Rosen. I'm a 1993 graduate of Spanish River High School, a 1997 graduate of the University of Florida. My entire education from the public school system. I'm a mom of two children, elementary and middle school in the Palm Beach County Public Schools. I'm an admitted mom of two kids who attend sleepaway camp in the Northeast. 
And while that does matter, it is not the main focus. But I do want to spend about 20 to 30 seconds reading you some quotes from kids ages 7 to 17, both boys and girls, on what a summer at sleepaway camp means to them. Everything. My happy place. A chance to make memories we can't make at home. Break of the stress from the day. Be outdoors. Learn leadership and positive behaviors. This is my favorite. In my life, I wait 10 months for two months. Camp is my home, and if someone makes me leave early, I will kick them. <laughs> Sleepaway camp means everything to me. Great fun, doing outdoor activities. It means I don't use my electronics for seven weeks. I talk. I do things with other kids. I am outdoors. I am participating in things. These are important things for children. Sleepaway camp means a home away from home. It is a chance to be with friends, unplugged. These kids spend seven weeks unplugged, no electronics. That's important. How many people in this room can say they spend seven, seven, day, seven minutes unplugged these days? They write letters, they talk, they gain independence. Palm Beach County is very diverse. No matter what someone's summer plans are, they are entitled to have them. And for those plans to be aligned with family and friends in other parts of the country and the world, whether they're going to the lake, camp, Canada, Europe, South America, just being with family, that's their choice. No one told us when we were little that we couldn't have our summer plants because our school calendars were way more aligned with everyone else than we are today. It affects our residents no matter what their kids do in the summer. Many people here today will speak about the summer heat, the number of days before and after winter break, Thanksgiving, for the record, I think is ridiculous that we have a week off. We're the only district in the state. Christmas break, all of that. Let's talk about two things. Our teachers, our teachers, our teachers. These people who are overworked, underpaid, they need their summer to be aligned with the rest of the country to earn additional income. They are not able to do that if this calendar continues the way it is. As a realtor, I want to focus on the fact, whether people like it or not, the Northeast is one of the biggest feeders into Palm Beach County real estate and the economy. Builders are putting money into our economy, our schools, and all we are hearing, I know there's many familiar faces in this room, people are reconsidering moving here and coming here. They are looking at our neighboring counties to the south. Their calendars are much more aligned. This will affect our real estate values in Palm Beach County moving forward if this calendar continues the way it is. There are so many simple and easy solutions to push the start date back. I know you have all thought of them. You don't need me to repeat them. It just needs to be done. I want to end with one last thing. I want everyone sitting in front of me to think about it. When you were children, who told you to leave your family and friends and start school four weeks before Labor Day, the unofficial end to summer? Someone told you to start school in early August. What would you have done? What would your parents have done? Well, here we are today. Thank you for your time. Mr. Burns, before you start speaking, Beth Miller, would you please come up to the other podium? Beth Miller. Go ahead, Mr. Burns. Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Burns. I am the proud father of two young children, elementary school age. I'm here on behalf of my family, my hardworking wife, and the many other hardworking parents who could not be here today because this board decided to schedule this meeting at 1 o'clock on a Wednesday after school just ended. For many local and national businesses, June is the busiest month, whereas August is the slowest month. So therefore, August is the best time to spend quality family time with your kids, whether that's going to a local park, going on a road trip, flying away, whatever the income level is, whatever it is that you can do with your kids, it's that family time that bonds families. This board is asking families to not have as much of that important family time. Some of us can't get out of the office for a week, five days, eight days in July. Some of us can't do that. I own my own business. I know that August is the easiest time for me to spend with my family. This board is asking me not to spend that time with my family. August 10th is the middle of the summer. We keep talking about lining up with the rest of the country. That is real. August 10th, that is four weeks before Labor Day. We've also mentioned the heat. Ms. Schistler put it very succinctly as it relates to recess. I don't want to even see what these teachers have to deal with when my kids don't get to play outside during the day. We are also dealing with school buses. I was, I, I'm also a public school kid, went to the University of Florida. I've ridden on those school buses. It is hot. The air conditioning doesn't always work. My kids ride the bus home. They tell me that sometimes the bus drivers don't even let them roll the windows down. I'm a plaintiff's lawyer in this county. 
I represent those that can't be that can't represent themselves. I have engaged in litigation with this board before. You are asking for more legal issues that you just don't need the, the earlier you start this, this school year. It is hot. Kids can have heat related issues. It just doesn't make any financial or legal sense to be doing what you're doing as it relates to the start date. And I hate to, to harp on it, but those three days in Thanksgiving, for those of us who have uh, dual working parents, it's just more of a problem. It's just an aggravation, really. It costs us money. I gotta, I gotta find somebody to watch my kids during the day. And it, you got three, those are three easy days there. Uh, the rest of the country doesn't do it. I don't understand why we do it here. I appreciate the time. School keeps just getting earlier and earlier. Like I said, four weeks before Labor Day. It just doesn't sound normal. At some point, common sense has to take over. Please, <laughs> please do not make our children start school in the middle of summer. At some point, it has to end. It's earlier and earlier. August 10th is not the answer. Thank you. Ron Knuck, would you please come up to the podium? Ron. Go ahead, Ms. Miller. Okay. Hi, thank you for having us today. Thank you for listening to us speak about the importance of sleepaway camp and the many benefits it has on our children. Being a Palm Beach County resident since 1983, starting at Wellington Elementary, we never started school earlier than August 22nd. The times have changed and more testing needs to be completed. So instead of beginning the school year on August 10th, I wish to have the school year begin the 17th and suggest the children attend Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Thanksgiving week. Those three days home are not necessary. It's hard for working parents to find childcare those days. And being a business owner myself, the only days we are closed that week is Thursday. I would also suggest that teachers send more additional FSA worksheets over the long winter break to help the children prepare for the tests. What won't help our children is making their summer shorter. They worked so hard all year harder than we've ever worked when we were little. They need this time to unwind, disconnect from electronics, exercise each day outside, play new sports, write letters home, make new friends, and have actual eye-to-eye -eye communication with each other. The learning that these children experience at sleepaway camp cannot be replicated in the classroom. That is why, as parents, we work so hard to provide this for our children. Please don't start school August 10th. Thank you. M Millie Weinstein, a student, would you please come up to the podium on the, my left? Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Good afternoon, everybody. Ron Kaniak. I'm a parent of three children in the school district. Um, some of you know me from conversations we've had about rezoning issues. This room is only full when parents are upset with stuff that's going on. The school board and the um, superintendent do a great job, and, and it's only when, when we're upset about decisions that are being made that the, that the room is full. And this is one of those issues. Um, I could echo all of the comments that people have made. Um, I've read through the presentation materials. Um, what I don't understand, and, and it's absent from the materials, is how Broward starts on August 14th, on how Miami-Dade manages to start on August 19th, um, it, what they do in Charlotte and DeSoto um, on August 7th and, and year-round is even crazier than what's being proposed here. Um, summer camp is important. Um, it's important for our teachers to be able to make extra money. It's important for our kids to get those experiences. I was at my nephew's bar mitzvah this weekend. They live up in New York. Um, and my sister's, um, my sister's three children, my sister-in-law's three children, and my three kids go to the same camp. The relationship that they have um, among themselves is so much closer because of the seven weeks of camp that they get together um, than they would otherwise get if they were just um, seeing each other for holidays or, uh, or random events. It, it is imperative. Um, I would beg you to, to consider moving the start date back, eliminating the three days at the Thanksgiving break, eliminating some of Christmas break um, that's unnecessary. Um, I appreciate the board's time and the decisions you need to make, but August 10th just doesn't work. Thank you. Michael Unger, would you come up to the podium on my right? Go ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Molly Weinstein, and I just graduated from eighth grade at Eagles Landing, and I will be going into ninth grade at West Boga High School. I believe the new schedule for the 2019 to 2020 school year and forward starts too early. 
And Florida, August is one of the hottest months. And although we are told the buses have, their, have air conditioning, but as a student, I can tell you that they don't. Bus drivers don't even, don't even allow us to roll down the windows. Most kids like me take the bus to and from school every day. And when we get on the buses at the very beginning of August, we're exposed to the, these extremely high temperatures even more. Also, my friends in Broward County start, always start school a week later than we do. It makes no sense why our schedules are different. Why is our district starting early? Students at Broward have plenty of time to get ready for school while we in Palm Beach County don't. And although it may not seem important to adults, kids, especially around my age, treasure the time that they have to get away and go to camp. All kids that go to camp live by the saying, tent for two, meaning we wait 10 months of ed education for the amazing two months of camp. Camp means everything to some kids, and by taking away that week, me and all of the kids that go to camp have most of that amazing time taken away. Last summer, many of us missed the first day of school, especially eighth grade, all because we missed our flight due to are due to flight cancellations caused by storms that typically, typically occur in August around the time we are supposed to get home. If we had that extra week, we wouldn't have to worry about storms causing us to miss our first day. We never have time to prepare for the school year because when we get home, we have one day to get ready. Kids from all over Florida have more, t more than enough time to get their school supplies and pick up their schedules when they have that extra week, while students in Palm Beach County don't have that time. I want to have the time to get school supplies, pick up my schedule, and rela relax before school. Thank you for allowing me this time, and I hope this issue will be taken into consideration. Thank you. Would Debbie Klingsberg please come up to the podium on my left? Go ahead, Ms. Drummond. Uh, thank you. I uh, honestly didn't want to be here doing this, but my wife asked me to, and I learned <laughs> the very hard way, don't ever say no to her. <laughs> Uh, I also want to thank the veterans for the service. Tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. My uncle was buried at the National Ceremony. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. So thank you. My name is Michael Unger. I am a parent of two kids at uh, Whispering Pines Elementary School, also known as the Angry Fighting Unicorns. I have been a strategy and operations business advisor for 28 years. And I've assisted companies uh, that you know, 3M, Macy's, other household names, with regard to resolving complex strategic and logistical issues. So I am viewing this situation through that lens, and I'm coming at it from a different angle. The rush to complete this semester prior to the December holidays is based on a highly speculative concept that the test scores are higher if the tests are taken before the holidays. So I want to be clear, there's no basis in fact for this. There is no current statistical data that supports this premise. It's a feeling. And we are moving and a calendar and wreaking havoc on the summer schedules of the entire county based on a feeling. We're solving an issue that we don't even know exists. So by predetermining that the calendar dictates better results than the educational process does, we're demonstrating a lack of faith in the educators, in the student body, and in the parents and guardians of our students. It is perfectly reasonable to expect students to maintain study habits and retain subject matter over a holiday period. We should expect it. Educators are charged with conveying lessons in a thought-provoking, compelling manner. Students are charged with learning the material. Parents and guardians are charged with oversight of the students' work progress at home. That is called everybody doing what they are expected to do, and it bears zero rele relevance as to whether it's performed before or after a holiday. So I implore this board, do not fix an issue that does not need fixing. Or as a great wise man, you may have heard of him, Charles Oakley, once said, if it ain't broke, don't break it. By navigating the process and not the calendar, you will give a solid endorsement to the skills of the educators, the efficacy of the education process, and the dedication of the student body. I want to address one more thing, which is the gap in pay that we're hearing about. This also seems to be a non-issue to me. There's no gap in pay. There's an annual salary, and there's a budgetary discipline that comes with an annual salary. So people aren't missing a paycheck if they're paid annually. I see head shaking, but I, you'll have to explain this to me uh, if, if I'm to fully understand this. I understand there's a salary and there's a budgetary discipline. But uh, I will end by saying, consider this. The early date is a bit myopic. It's not a solution-oriented resolution. A solution-oriented resolution is one that would include the broad perspective and the implications of a broad perspective on, on the solution, and this isn't doing that. Uh, this seems just to be something forced in that's wreaking havoc. Thanks. Thank you. 
Would, would Mandy Newman please come up to the podium that was just vacated? Go, go ahead, Mrs. Clinton. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Debbie Klingsberg. I have seven-year-old twins uh, currently attending Calusa Elementary, and I live in Woodfield Country Club. Um, I d didn't coordinate my appearance as obviously I'm sitting on the wrong side of the room, um, but I, I explained to my twins as I dropped them off um, at Grandma's house so I could come here today that you can't just sit back in the audience and expect things to be done for you. So I'm here just to put a face with this issue, um, my kids are going to go to Camp Winnedu and Camp Danby, hopefully not next year, because um, I still would like to have them at home one more time, but they will be going. And I spoke to Camp Danby this morning, and I asked them their dates for 2020. They're voting on it tonight. But as it current stands, they would begin on August 14th and 15th, which would mean that my kids would miss a full week. Uh, I thought what the young woman said about how she'd like to have a day to prepare, uh, but these guys are even coming back. They're, they would just miss the f whole first week of uh, either school or camp. Um, and I want, it, it's sometimes helpful when you're thinking in the abstract, but to focus on individuals. And I, they are attending camp with their cousins who, as uh, Ron mentioned, you know, it's an important bonding time. And it's not a theoretical loss. This is a real first week. It's a choice that I have to make as a parent, whether I want my kids to miss the first week of school or the last week of camp. And I hope it's a decision that I don't have to make. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Katz, uh, President of CTA, would you please come to the podium on my left? Go ahead, Ms. New Ms. Uh, Newman. Good afternoon. I'm going to be echoing a lot of the thoughts of some others behind me. I'm a full-time employee of a summer camp located in Massachusetts and a parent of two children who attend Palm Beach County schools. I'm representing like-minded parents, camp staff, including Palm Beach County teachers who feel the proposed calendar does not align with the rest of the country and even our neighboring Broward County. Four weeks before Labor Day is just unacceptable. The earlier start date will negatively affect many children, parents, and teachers. Palm Beach County teachers as we said, count on the employment at summer camps to supplement their income during the summer. They will be at risk of losing these positions they've had for years if they have to return early to prepare their classrooms because camp employers need their staff to complete their summer in full. We believe it's way too hot here in Florida to be on school buses that are not always functioning, as we've heard. Children cannot go outside for recess in mid-August, which is imperative for these children to have a break from their, from their learning time. The relatively new Thanksgiving break, in my opinion, is excessive and has also become an inconvenient for parents who are working. They have nowhere to send their children, and it's just, as I said, excessive. Again, it does not line up with the rest of the country. We appreciate you considering the later start date of August 17th for this coming year. Thank you for listening, and thank you for the veterans that are representing today. Ma'am, ma'am, before you leave the podium, ma'am, ma'am. Just, ma'am, I know your name, but you didn't say it. I need it on the record. So. My name is Mandy Newman. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Katz. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Katz. I'm the president of the Palm Beach County Classroom Teachers Association, the teachers union here in Palm Beach County. Um, so I'll try to run through these rapid fire because there's a couple different issues, and I want to make sure I convey my position as a leader of the teachers in Palm Beach County and express that, that my desire here, and if anyone's ever heard me talk, is usually to try to find some compromise or middle ground and not punish or harm any one party, um, which, which some of the statements or recommendations that I heard uh, so far today absolutely would do, which is, a, is an issue. Uh, first and foremost, with regards to Veterans Day, we fully support and have always supported having that day out for our educators. We have a large number of veterans in the classroom and in the schools, uh, so it only makes sense. So obviously we support that becoming a holiday, not just a work day for teachers, but a holiday for teachers and employees of the district. Um, with regards to the start date, I've heard a lot of people reference what teachers want. I haven't heard any single teacher, and I represent over 7,000 of them, weigh in on the start date. I think the teachers are completely unconcerned about the start date itself. They are very concerned about the implications of the start date. Um, and as you heard from some of the other bargaining units, some of the lower paid um, income earners, they would literally uh, have to wait an additional two weeks to receive their pay. So there, there are implications to the start date. I don't have a personal opinion. If you cannot have these negative consequences occur and start the school year later, that is the compromise solution. I support the position of the people who have come here today 
but not if it comes at the expense of thousands of employees. So first and foremost, to those other bargaining units, because it's my understanding that the pay gap would likely not affect teachers so much. And while teachers are on salary, some of our lower paid employees are not on salary. So it would absolutely create a two week void in their expected income. Um, with regards to the test, the midterm test after the Christmas break, the winter break, uh, that is a line in the sand for teachers, especially high school teachers. I don't know if there's statistical evidence, but as a high school teacher for the past 12 or 13 years, and you could ask any high school teacher, if you hold those exams after winter break, you might as well cancel them. It is a waste of time. There is momentum that builds throughout a semester and culminates in those tests. And if you go and you have a two week break where kids are trying to relax, they come back, you start the second semester with a week of review of content that was taught over the past four months, there's a two week vacation gap, and then you hold those exams. I can tell you firsthand. Ladies and gentlemen, you had the respect of nobody talking, so be quiet. Go ahead, Mr. Katz. I can tell you firsthand that it, you might as well cancel them. I know that this is something that Dade does, but I don't see at the bottom of Dade's presentations top performing urban school district in Florida. We're the highest performing school district. I don't want to copy an inferior district, no offense to Dade, but we need to hold the line on that semester. I've heard that the Thanksgiving break should be on the chopping block. I agree. That was a gimmick that was implemented two years ago to help with recruitment. We have a new gimmick. It's called the referendum. $10,000 is more of a recruitment tool than three days before a holiday. Uh, so the Thanksgiving break, you know, that's the easiest low hanging fruit. Um, it's just, you can't mess with the end date for the semester because it will absolutely affect their test scores. And I know that nobody likes to highlight that test scores are an impetus for decisions we make, but that is the reality. Teacher pay and evaluations are based on those test scores and student performance. And if the teachers have to get pay cuts because students perform worse on a test administered after the break, that is a problem for me. I don't think teachers should be financing the later start date. Um, the last thing I'll say is that we have semester courses that start in January, which means if you push back the January start date for second semester, those courses lose that time and it can't be picked up unless you were to add a week or two to the schedule at the end of the school year. I can speak from experience teaching uh, seniors in particular, they already leave a month early. So it's just, you know, again, the line in the sand for teachers is the semester has to end when it's supposed to end. I won't miss any, take up any more time, but I agree with the position on trying to work with the parents and their concerns, but I do not think that the employees should financially take on hardships and be affected in a way that would cause them damage to their financial and professional situation. So I, I urge you to work to a compromise. Um, I don't think that the, the pain on this should fall squarely on employees of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Um, I just want to clear up one misconception before the superintendent starts the workshop. This board had concerns about the, the recommendation for this calendar came from the workshop committee. I mean, the calendar committee. This board had concerns. That's why we scheduled this workshop today. So the in, 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 insinuations out there that this board is trying to do something that you don't agree with is, is not accurate. So that's why we scheduled this workshop today so we could hear from the administration, hear from all of you to make, an, make a decision on this. The board has not weighed in one way or the other on whether we're going to support the calendar that's been proposed. That's what today is for. So, Mr. Superintendent. Yes, at this time, um, considering what the chair said, we will be conducting a workshop. Uh, for the board to hear the recommendation from the committee. Um, but the, to, to the chair's point, the board is not voting on anything today. This is just information for the community at large. At this time, I turn it over to the committee associated with the calendar. Good afternoon. Um, I'm so glad that we're going to get an opportunity to explain to you and to the general public about how the calendar is uh, created. So we have a PowerPoint here that we're going to walk through it with you for the calendar development process. So first we start off with scored policy. Can you policy. pull your microphone a little oh, closer? Oh, thank you. Sorry. I have a tendency to talk too fast, so just give me a hand gesture if you think I'm talking oh. too fast. Um, School <clears throat> policy 2.35 requires that in the spring of each year, the board's going to be presented with a calendar for adoption. Um, the proposed calendar is prepared by a committee that's um, been appointed by the superintendent, and this was established back in 1982. 
The committee consists of the following people, and we've contractually bargained um, some of these members, like CTA has three representatives, ASOP, SEIU, Staff Association, all have representatives on the committee. We also have representation from, an, we have at least one elementary principal, one middle, one high. We generally have also PTA representatives. We contact the, the PTA reps for the county and they submit someone to attend. School transformation department has a representative. Payroll, employee and labor relations, our FTE school reporting, they all come to these committees. And we've recently added um, Eric Stern, who handles the graduations, and he's been attending these as well. So the community um, approves a recommended calendar that's presented by staff and that, or they can create one for their own consideration, to be quite honest, but we come up with calendars and then we pass them along to the school board. So this is kind of a balancing act, and I tried to think of a good analogy, and I couldn't really think of one that really matched because it's just, there are so many moving pieces to this. It's almost like you're walking a tightrope and you have that big pole, and the, the pole is really what's best for our kids, right? Because that's what we're here for. So as you add things to either side, it can skew it and throw the whole system out of whack. So some of the things that we have to do are in Florida statutes and rules, so under Florida statutes, we can start no earlier than August 10th. Then there's the Florida Administrative Code that we have to have 180 days for students or the equivalent thereof in hours, which is about 900 hours to get that full-time FTE. Then we also have Florida statutes that deal that you have to have 135 hours of bona fide instruction in a design course of study that has student performance standards for credit for graduations. Now we go on a semester. So we have 67 and a half. We have to get at least 67 and a half hours in, the, for in each semester for a student to get credit for graduation. Then we're also up against, I heard all the comments about our low paid employees and we've got to come up with another solution. Well, here's our problem. Florida statute says that no salary payment can be paid to any employee in advance of services being rendered. That's this payroll gap we talk about. We can't pay employees in advance they work for two weeks. We have that two week lag time with the salaries for our bus drivers moving the, the calendar back when they talked about it. It's a, instead of it being an eight week gap that they usually have in the summer, that would be a 10 week gap. Um, we fall into more problems when it's the teachers because it's a much larger unit, but that's the payroll gap and we're kind of handcuffed by Florida statutes there. As for Veterans Day, we'd love to give Veterans Day as a paid holiday. I myself would love to have Veterans Day off. My problem is Florida statute says that we only get six paid holidays. So collectively bargained, we have teachers are guaranteed 196 duty days, six of which are unassigned paid holidays. For the SEIU, FPSU, which are our blue collar unions, um, the only group that's guaranteed a certain number of duty days that we have to consider is they get 182. They get, do not get paid holidays. Any of our employees who are less than 12 months do not get paid holidays. And to give them a paid holiday would have to be collectively bargained. And there is a pay, um, a budgetary impact to that because once you give one, why aren't we giving six? So again, that's with ASOP as well. It's only 12 month employees who receive a paid, um, paid holidays. So generally here's what we're having to balance along with what's best for students we have started on the second Monday in August for years. Going back to about 2003, there's some gaps in there where the legislature made some changes to the law about when we could start. That's the only time what we've deviated from this practice. Teachers start a week earlier than that. After every nine weeks or trimesters, we have what's called, you'll see on the calendar, a duty PD day. For part of our teachers, if it's the end of a nine weeks, our secondary teachers are getting what's called a duty day in which they can input grades and finish up their grading, call parents, that kind of thing. For the elementaries at that time, they're getting professional development. Then the reverse is true at the end of trimesters. We've contractually agreed to this with CTA. It's not in the contract, but it is a past practice that we have had for as many years as I can remember that they have these gaps so that they can get the work done they need and that we can push out professional development to make them the best teachers that we possibly can. So the holidays for students and teachers are generally Labor Day. We have two fall holidays and that's how some districts are getting away with starting later is there are two fall holidays. We don't give off religious holidays but these happen to be when we schedule the fall holidays, they're Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. 
So there are districts who do not do that, and that's two days that they can add or take away from the start of the school year. We have Thanksgiving break, winter break, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, spring break, the spring holiday, and Memorial Day. What throws into problems is what we're going to see in the 2021 calendar is elections. When we have elections, the supervisor of elections and our chief of police would prefer that we're closed. If we have that many people on campus, particularly in 2020, what you'll see on the calendar, we didn't anticipate the primary date. That's a date that's going to have to come off, and we're going to have to find another space in first semester for that, which would be August 25th. But we do have to look at the elections and primaries of when those are. Veterans Day, we have traditionally given Veterans Day off, at least for students, every other year. We polled the municipalities. We only received um, input from 16 of them. Of the 16 municipalities that responded as to what are they doing for Veterans Day, only eight of them are having it on Veterans Day. The rest are having them on the weekends before. Um, of the eight that are having on Veterans Day, only seven of them are during the work day. One of them is at sunset, so it would be after school. So the, the idea that there's events that they could go to doesn't really hold water given what we've heard back from the municipalities. We also need to maintain a hurricane buffer. The most active time we have for hurricanes, according to the National Hurricane Center, is between mid-August and mid-October. So to avoid hurricane season, we really can't, unless you wanted to have summer be from August to October to avoid the, the, the most time when we're going to get hit with a hurricane. That's the only way to do it. Um, we also have to have first semester exams prior to Winter Bay, as you heard from Mr. Katz. Um, we floated this idea at the high school principals meeting, and there was not a single high school principal who thought this was a good idea to move those back. So we do attempt to the best of our ability to get a 90-day spread, 90 days in one, 90 days in the other. It's just not really possible. Given the number of holidays that just naturally occur in the first semester, we're always going to be off. But we do have to try and get that. And then adding on top of that, that payroll gap that we discussed. So looking at the 1920 calendar, this was approved by the calendar committee, and it was actually approved by the board back in 2017. We brought it back to the board in April of this year because we noticed we had heard the veterans. They wanted Veterans Day off. We noticed that there was one of those duty PDD days, happened to be the Friday before Veterans Day. We asked that we swap it so that this, at least the students would be off for Veterans Day in um, November of 2019. And then it really doesn't – involved this conversation, but there was another error that the 10-hour, four-day work weeks we have in the summertime, it went an extra week that should have not been there. So that's why we brought it back to the board um, this April. The approved start date for students is August 12th. This is the second Monday. It's, it is um, one day earlier than last year, and it's two days earlier than Broward. But the, um, the approved last date was May 29th. It has an 84-95 split of the 179 days. It's, the special challenge for this calendar was it's difficult to have that 90-90 split. So for start dates, just for purposes of the 1920, 57 counties in Florida, including Palm Beach, are scheduled to start August 12th. I think that's actually an error. It should be 58 because for some reason Brevard gave the date of August 11th as their start date. That's a Sunday. So I suspect that Brevard is actually starting on that Monday as well. So of the 68 counties in Florida, 58 are starting on August 12th. Charlotte County has year-round schools. DeSoto, I'm not sure how they're able to start earlier than statutory allows. Um, Clay and Collier, the 13th. Broward's the 14th. Miami-Dade starts the 19th. Miami-Dade has a different pupil progression plan than we do. They do not have semester exams. They don't have the end-of-course exams that are not mandated by the state, so they don't have exams after the winter break. They also don't give that 67 and a half hour window for semester credit. What they do have is they'll have an exam, but it waits no heavier than any other exam. And then Jefferson County was unpublished with the DOE, but they are a, are a complete and total charter district. They only have three schools. All three of them are charter schools. So here are the paid holidays. For 12-month employees, 4th of July, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Martin Luther King's birthday, and Memorial Day. The teachers, we just swap out 4th of July for New Year's Day because they're not working in July. In, in the state of Florida, 42 counties are closing on Veterans Day, and that's just we know that schools are closed. We can't tell necessarily that they're closing their entire operations, but 23 counties are keeping the schools open on those days. 
if we add under Florida statutes, if we want to add Veterans Day as a paid holiday, something has to come off. You have to make the decision to remove one of these other days as a paid holiday. So here's what the 1920 calendar looks like. What we're proposing is moving that Friday the 8th, which is a PD day, moving that to Monday the 11th so our students would have Veterans Day off. That's the only change we'd like that, that we had proposed making to this calendar. And here's second semester. Um, there's no changes to be made there. So going on to the 2021 calendar, this has been approved by the calendar committee. The proposed start date for students is August 10th. It's the second Monday. The proposed end date is May 29th. Again, it's an 85-94 split with the holidays that I mentioned before. The special challenges here are the August 25th primary, which currently is not a day off for students. We are going to have to have the calendar committee figure that one out. Students are off on November 3rd for the general election, but not for Veterans Day. And again, it's that 90-90 split. We're ending up at an 84-95 split every year, no matter how we're slicing it. So here's what this calendar looks like. And you'll see there's some circled dates on here. So the 25th is circled in red because that's a date that we're going to have to remove um, because that's when the presidential primaries are going to be. Given the um, political climate, there's going to be a lot of people on our campuses that day, so we really shouldn't have students there. It's going to most likely have to be a day that we're closed because it doesn't fit as a duty PDD day for teachers simply because if we do that, then we'd have to add an extra day to their calendar. So they would, instead of working 196, we'd have to collectively bargain to work them 197 and pay them an extra day um, if we wanted the 25th for them to be on the campus. So there's only a couple options that we can do. Well, let me go back. The 11th is circled in red, too. It's kind of um, a dash line because that's up to you of whether you want to have school. Um, we have discussed among staff of maybe having some kind of civics education mandated at the schools at that date so that we have the veterans come to the students rather than the students coming to the veterans so that they are getting that education and getting that um, perspective that they need to have. So there's really only four days that we have to play with. Um, none of them are very, very good. So if we have, if we take Veterans Day off and the 25th off, we have to make up two days. You have several options, too, that I know are not very good, or Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We could hold schools on those days. I don't think that that's a good idea. The other two days are the 21st and 22nd of December. When we tried before to move that winter break back, we had a whole different set of parents come in and complain about their winter vacations, their skiing, wanting to leave. Some of you are shaking your heads. We all remember that. So those are the only. this is the only place we have to move around. So we can... If we take the two days off of December, my concern also is the, the attendance. When we had Thanksgiving week where the children came in on Monday and Tuesday, the last year we did it, we had approximately 12,000 students absent on Monday and about 15,000 absent on Tuesday. My suspicion is closing the 21st and 22nd in December, we're going to, have, we're going to exceed that. I anticipate we're going to be at least 10% of our students will not be here on those two days. Adding it to the end of the calendar, like we said, doesn't help. It helps adding additional days to second semester, but it doesn't help with first semester. So this is really driven by that 67 and a half. You have to build in days for hurricanes. You have to build in the time for um, other issues that may come up. The state does waive some of those requirements when it's a major storm. But when we have storms like in Isaac where it just floods, we may not get that waiver by the state, and we don't want to put the kids in jeopardy for attending a full semester of school, but through no fault of their own, don't get credit for it. So going on to the 21-22 calendar, again, this is a proposed start date of August 10th. It's the second Tuesday because the second Monday is too early. This ends on May 27th. Again, it's an 84-95 split. The difficulty is just trying to get that 90-90 split with, with everything that we have to do in it. So this is the 21-22 calendar of what it would look like. If you want to move school back a few days, we could possibly do that. But again, you're going to cut into the December break or you're going to have to lose Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur just because those are, the, those are the days. When you lose a day that has a phone on it, for every, Mr. Burke can correct me, but for two days, it's a 1% pay increase that you're going to have to pay people who are not scheduled to work. The people who have that phone, that means the whole district is shut down. If you're asking people to work without pay, that's going to be problematic. So that it has a 
stronger budget implication than if you just take off the days that just have the pencil associated with them. So that's the 21-22 calendar. Now, when you start moving days back, which we've talked about, okay, well, if we move the semester back, let me just go see if I can figure out how to... Yeah, how do you move it back one slide? Okay, good. Okay, so if we wanted to move the winter break back, which I don't think there's any support amongst your, admit, your, your educators to do so, you can't just come back one week, have review and have the testing. So you're basically pushing it back at least two weeks for review for the parent, for the students. You can't then have the um, students test on the week of the 17th because of the Martin Luther King holiday. It's only four days. Most schools, a lot of them need the full five days in order to do testing. So you're gonna end up moving it back three weeks instead of just the one. The other issue that you're gonna run across is when you get to the end of the school year, if you're just adding a few days, you're gonna have Memorial Day, and then you're gonna ask the students to come back, what, one day or two days? Again, you run into that absentee issue, and we really only have the kids for 179 days, and we really should be maximizing the education that we're able to provide them. So going back to, this is the school start date in Palm Beach County, and this goes back to when I started here in 2003. We can go back even further. I have discovered that there is a book somewhere that goes back into the 60s, um, to show when we started school and what the calendars look like. But we went back to 2003. We think this is a good sample. We generally start that second week in August. We, when we've come in, where it comes in the 2007, 8, that was when the statutory change went into place. It said it would tied it to Labor Day, which also didn't work because Labor Day, as you see, the calendar floats. The, the second Monday in August is not always going to be the 10th. It's going to be the 15th, it's going to be the 14th, 13th, 12th. As we move through the years with leap year being added, it's just the constant flow of the calendar. So if you go, you extrapolate out, I know that the concern was that we're going to be starting on August 10th all the time, and that's just not accurate. When we go and we estimate, we extrapolate out, going back into the 2930 calendar, when we do the second Monday, you'll see we're going to have about three years where it starts around the 10th, and then it goes back to starting on the 14th which is where you can see from the calendar we have generally tried to start. It's generally the second week, except when the um, legislation came into play that told us when we had to start. So do we have any discussion? Now where do we start? Um, Ms. Whitfield? Ms. Brill? I'll go first. Because everybody here knows that I think our calendars are crazy anyway. I've been talking about it for years, only because... I grew up up north, and we started school after Labor Day, so I still never... Please, let me finish my thoughts, because I'm getting old, I'll forget them. So, um, you know, I, I find it crazy. The simple solution that came to my mind right away was that if the school year runs a week later, and we start a week later, there's no gap in pay. But, hang on, please. But I realized that, if, you know, I, I did hear from teachers, but they weren't high school teachers. So I will um, let Mr. Katz know that, you know, I support, I understand where the, where the high school teachers are coming from. But what piqued my interest was when you said about Miami-Dade that they don't have end-of-course exams. I'm wondering if there's a way, and this is just something for staff and CTA to consider, administering the, the test before the break and then letting the semester continue in January and when they come back go over the materials that were missed on those exams so that the exams are still before the break and because I get it you know I understand what Mr. Katz said so I don't know if that's an answer the other thing I like you know was listening to everybody and as as Ms. Rosen said you know there there's a lot of simple easy solutions but they're not so easy like three days back from Thanksgiving and three days around the Christmas holidays, you know, putting those back on the calendar. Um, I will not support a calendar that does not close us on Veterans Day anymore. I mean, I think that we have to, we have to respect the people who have served our country. So, you know, that's my line in the sand. But again, I would just implore staff and the union to, to think a little out of the box about that end of course exam because that shouldn't be driving our calendar. And if we have to go in order to make sure SCIU and ASOP and the other unions don't get a gap in pay, go a week or two into June. It's not the end of the world. The rest of us have gone through that before. But at the end of the day, we have to work with our constituents. Thank you. 
Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. And my line in the sand, as I said a month or so ago, is that I will not support a calendar that does not include Veterans Day. That's one of my lines in the Ladies sand. Ladies and gentlemen, I know, I know you, some of you are going to be happy, some of you are not going to be happy with the remarks. Would you just hold your applause so we can get through this? We have a lot of things on our agenda today. Thank you. Go ahead, Mrs. Andrews. And I'm looking at this because I don't want anybody to lose any money. I work very closely with uh, the non-instructional employees, and I was a teacher. And I remember all of these days when we started at all these different times. I remember when the laws change. I think we have to get out of the box and do it differently. I don't want to repeat everything that Mrs. Brill said, but I'd recognize us staying a week later and being able to do what we have to do so that we can give the children an opportunity to rest, to be able to be with family, to be able to be energized to come back to school to do the things that they need to do. And so uh, I can see us. I was here when we actually only had those two days for Thanksgiving. It can go back to that. I, I remember all of the times we fluctuated with this to meet the needs of the students. So I just think this is really cut in the sand uh, the way we've done it based on what We've done for years, but we've got to get out of the box and think about how we can do it a lot better so that we can represent all of our families here and also to let everybody know it's truly important that we uh, make sure that students and families are heard and that we really do our job and due diligence to make sure that we can put those days back in. I'm not interested in taking out our fall vacation and spring vacation days. I know the semblance of those days. That's truly important. But I think we can maneuver this. And if we have to get out a little later, then so be it, because we have to pay it off one way or the other. So I'm willing to do that. Ms. Ms. Whitfield, then Ms. McQuinn. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of, of points that I really, um, you know, really that resonate with me. Ms. Evans, I want to say thank you for your tightrope analogy. I feel like that is what we are doing here. We are walking down a tightrope. Um, there are so many issues to be considered in this. And to me, the most important thing is um, our families that are um, paid and would lose paychecks during this time. We can't ask families to not have money coming into their paychecks. This is... Um, a time where these people wouldn't be able to feed their children. It would rely on other methods within our community that don't have extra dollars to spend. Um, we can't ask our bus drivers who are already working at poverty wages and our school food service people who are working at poverty wages to go without um, food or possibly miss a rent paycheck um, because we want to accommodate. To me, that is that is that is a very, very difficult line in the sand for me. Um, now, if we can work that out, I would understand if we can figure out that issue. Um, obviously, we want to help every family have a summer camp experience. But to me, we have to rank those priorities in, in level of importance. So um, I would be happy to move it back if that's something that we can pull off doing. Um, a couple of things I do want to say about this, though, that I think are really important is look at the mandates that the state is putting on us. Look at the level of mandates that come in that say that we have to have all of these rules and they all have to be accommodated. And this tightrope begets very difficult to walk. Um, one of the things that's going to be during my discussion later in the day is how difficult our children's day Days are how difficult it is for our for our teachers to pull off all these things the reason we are pushing so hard to get so many days and time in the classroom is because these teachers are working harder than they ever have before and as you said your students are working harder than they ever have before to fit in as much learning as they possibly can so that we can get their grades done their testing done we can get their reading levels up it is a lot of pressure on these families on these children on especially our teachers to accomplish all these things. So I encourage you to contact the state and talk to them about some of these high, these high level mandates that we have been given. So I think that's very important. The other thing, I am the one that's pushing for Thanksgiving and here's my reason. There's a couple of reasons for me. People don't show up during Thanksgiving. If you do show up, the teachers don't do a lot during that time. Um, there's really not a lot being accomplished academically during that time. Um, as they said, the attendance levels are not great. And I just hate 
that I hear people leaving on Tuesday nights and Wednesday mornings and, and stuck in so much traffic. We don't have to do that to you all. You, you can have your vacation there too. So to me, that's a lot of families that we really have to consider the safety of trying to get everybody on a plane and flying them to New York for a Thanksgiving holiday too. Uh, the final thing I want to mention is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not acceptable places for us to change dates. Um, to me, I, the the respect that we have to give to our Jewish community um, is is really high. Um, it just I, I wish we did holidays for every one of our um, of our religious groups within the community, even if we call them fall holidays. Um, that is. That is a, um, a line I just don't think we should cross either. Um, I have a lot of issues with the idea of other communities that don't, um, that don't give those days off um, and, and what it says about respecting the community groups. So um, those are all of my thoughts. I would love to hear something along the lines of what Ms. Brill had said. Um, but I think that this is an emotional topic and I think we have to put a little bit more thought into it. Thank you. Mrs. McQuinn. Thank you. So first, I agree also about continuing to give days off for Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. Um, I also agree with Veterans Day, holiday for everyone. Although I do want to put in a caveat here from my own observation, the stu I have been to so many incredible school ceremonies for Veterans Day where I know the students are literally there honoring veterans and, and they're hearing from experience of veterans that they're not going to be having at home. But that's not, we can't win this one. Do I think kids get more out of being in school? Yes, because I don't think their families are honoring the day. But if I had to vote now, yes, I would agree that we get the day off. I'm always going to have an issue with the fact that we started altering our calendar to fit state testing. Yeah. It's not acceptable. And until we can help the legislature understand, this is foolish. And I've said it before. There isn't a private school in Palm Beach County, I don't know about the nation, who tests our kids like this. We give them one standardized, nationally normed test, and we plan our curriculum around it. And believe me, and Dr. Fenoy asked me to go to Tallahassee next year, and I so have my comments ready about, I really do. I really want us to figure out, who has figured out how much money it costs for FSA our publishing companies, we have a whole testing department. Every district has a testing department. How much money do we put into Florida State Assessment? So that's just important to me down the line, and it could be figured out. So I have a real objection to the fact that we moved our calendar to accommodate, several years ago, standardized testing. I do care about the employee salaries. You know, remember, I've been around so long, as has Mr. Shaw, probably Ms. Andrews, that teachers, you know, we were paid the last day of our working calendar, and we didn't get paid again until we came back. So you learned how to budget very well. But now we're in a situation that I don't know how to fix that. And I agree it's a very, very important piece of what we do. But I'm... I, I, it's hard to live with um, a second Monday start date. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, here we are again. So let me just first ask for some follow-up. I want follow-up on Charlotte having year-round schools because I still think that we should have a choice option for some schools to be year-round. Secondly, um, to follow up on this Miami-Dade and not having the semester exams, um, though to the point that they may not be the example we really want to follow, but I would like more information. Um, and additionally, the, so the calendars that started on August 22nd, I would like to see them, and if you would just help us compare and contrast 
um, like what the rules were then versus the rules now? I'm on, you don't have to tell me now, but, and I'm gonna I'm a need it in hard copy because that's just how I process information. Um, but it just be interesting to follow through that thought process on what's, what's different now than then. So, um, and Mrs. McQuinn, when you go to Tallahassee, find out who's making the money on the FSA, would you? So um, <laughs> now, so let me go to, I, I really don't, well, I guess since people are putting their non-negotiables on the table, let me put mine. So I'm going to, I agree, I don't want anybody missing any paychecks, right? And so some people, first off, our teachers don't make enough, but Lord have mercy, we have so many employees that make much less than that. I mean, it's no budgeting. You start with close to zero. You can't budget that. Um, so that's a non-negotiable. MLK is a non-negotiable. So if we look at the paid holidays, to me, the one that's um, most likely to be changed is actually Good Friday. And I say that after having worked at the Veterans Administration as a primary care physician for two decades and working on Good Friday. Is there a rule against that too? No, Good Friday is not a paid holiday. It's oh, a day in I which we're closed. No, ma'am. No, oh, it's not a paid holiday. A okay. your, your options are Fourth of July, uh, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Martin Luther King, and Memorial Day. Yeah, okay. Well, sorry. There isn't a good choice. It's no good choice there. Okay, I thought I had come up with a little something, but maybe not. Okay, so then let me go on. I want to talk about Veterans Day for a minute. So uh, Veterans Day is not on my non-negotiable list. However, if there's some magical way we could pull that off, I think um, that I would like to have schools closed on Veterans Day. Uh, not that I really think that it's going to help people appreciate your service, okay? Um, but because it's important to you. Um, I agree with Mrs. McQuinn that what I, I see our young people learning um, that freedom is not free on Veterans Day. Hopefully they will learn that more days of the year and not just on Veterans Day. But I'm good if we could figure out how to do it with Veterans Day um, being a no school for anybody day. Now, in terms of that Thanksgiving week, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just be rude and say it. Some people would say that that's the best thing Dr. Vosa did was to give us that whole week off. I'm just telling you, we got rave reviews. And you know, it's interesting because I really don't know that the general public really feels how hard many of our employees work, right? And it was like when that week came, it was, it was a reprieve. It was a breath of fresh air. And I really don't want to take that away from, from them. Um, then now, the, the other holiday breaks, there's, can we come back early? Can, so the, the, the duty, the PDD day, that's the first, that Monday in January, what's the downside of making that a all school day? Well, the problem is we have to fit that duty PDD day in for teachers. Um, somewhere. Somewhere, and you'd have to do it the day before the holiday. And like we've discussed, teachers are permitted under the contract to take comp time on a duty day. But so that would be the end of the second nine weeks. Your elementary school teachers would not be permitted to take comp time that day. They would be involved in professional development. That's why we do it after the break um, rather than before the break. We didn't think it was fair to the teachers. Okay. I'm just not coming up with solutions here. So, um, so let me just say this. So for those people who talk about the summer camps and so forth, I, all I have to say is you are so blessed. That is a problem to have, right? The, so the children that cause my heart to hurt are those who don't have AC at home and want to come to school for the AC, that don't have food, 
and want to be at school for the food, right? The kids that we talk about summer slide, I mean, that's why I want to explore year-round school. We have children that, in my opinion, need to be in school more. We need to do more creative things, but they need to be in school more. Um, so, I, you know, as I don't, I don't have the, obviously, I haven't found the answer. I'm looking for the answer. Um, it seems that the calendar committee has explored almost every nook and cranny here. So if there's some, some magic that somebody can find, I'm happy to look at it. But the, I need the children who have fewest blessings to be in school. Thank you. Ms. McQuinn and then Ms. Brill. Just very quickly, when the district piloted many years ago year-round schools at Jupiter High School, there was no, first of all, the parents, this is survey, parents did not like it because they had children in different levels, schools, et cetera. But there was no significant difference in um, student achievement scores. Yeah. Ms. Brill. Thank you. So when you come back to us, I'd like to know, because I keep seeing the simple solution, start school a week later and end school a week later. And then there's no gap in pay. Um, but as far as, and I, and I understand what Dr. Robinson is saying about the children, you know, um, that, that don't have opportunities. But I do know that we have camps that do offer no t tuition free programs. I went to sleep away to a Jewish Federation camp where my family paid nothing because we didn't have any blessings. I know those schools, those camps still exist for people. But the bottom line is, you know, if we could get through this whole issue about the semester ending, if it has to do with the testing, if there's a way to administer those tests, before, you know, earlier, before the break, so that there's no negative impact on the teachers and on the students, and then just start a week later, and a week later, then there should be no gap in pay. I think that just solves everything. Ms. Andrews. I need to clarify. Thank you. I like that, Ms. Brill, and that's what I was following when we first spoke. I am so happy to see our state representatives here uh, today. Ms. Polsky, thank you for what you do, and Ms. Slosberg, that's, this is big to me. You're at the root of where the problem starts, and it's right there in Tallahassee. And uh, we have a wonderful Palm Beach County delegation. And as we began to try to get this fixed for this year, I would like to see something proposed because all of these districts are suffering the way that we're, we're suffering. I remember when this was discussed many years ago, the start date, problems with districts all over. We're traveling to Tampa next week with the Florida School Boards Association. This is something that I'm going to bring up to them as one of the issues that we need to put back on the table with the legislature. So I'm asking you to make it a priority with all of our representatives from our, um, our uh, school board delegations out there with our Palm Beach County delegation, legislative delegations, from all of the superintendents associations. We're all together in a few days, begin to talk about this issue because it's going to come back again and we want to get it solved. And as a result, it is about the over-testing, and we have to come together as leaders to stop it and stop it now. So if you can take the lead on that for us, Mrs. Slosberg and Ms. Polsky here, and I know all of the other delegation members, they need to be made aware. It is a problem that school districts all over the state of Florida are having to suffer through, and we need to get fixed. And a lot has to do with over-testing, so thank you. Ms. Evans. Mr. Burke would like to really explain the pay gap issue. Thank you. Yes, thanks. It is complicated, but I want to just, uh, Ms. Brill, I appreciate your efforts to try to, to solve this problem here. But with, with the pay gap, the, the gap is from, you know, our employees are fully paid for the school year, and they, they won't actually lose money. But what happens is when one year ends and they're fully paid for the prior school year, uh, that amount of time that they have to wait until they earn their first check the subsequent school year. And for some of our employees, their contracts are not much longer than the school year. So that pushing the school year a little bit later uh, does create, you know, where they end up waiting like another two-week pay cycle until they earn that first check. In order for us, Ms. Evans pointed out that state statute does not allow the school board to employ or to pay people before the services are rendered. 
uh, we interpret that that employee must work at least one day within the two-week pay period to generate a paycheck. And then because we kind of level their pay out over the school year, we go ahead and they, they see a full check, even though they may have only worked as little as one day in that first pay period. So we're, we're stretching all of that to try to make this work. But I have looked at just the, uh, the one-week shift, and we do have a number of employees that would get caught up in that. Uh, we had a, a couple speakers, uh, the gentleman from SEIU, uh, Mr. Laporte, was, was right on. Uh, the bus drivers, that gap between when they custom, you know, normally they have to wait uh, eight weeks in between the school years to see that check, it would be 10 weeks. Um, so we can report that back as well, but I just don't want anyone to walk away from here with the impression that uh, a one-week shift does not create any payroll issues because there will be issues to work through. Uh, we've dealt with this in the past. Uh, you know, with notice, we can try. If we have to face this, what we've done in the past is told employees, start planning for it, try, try to save money, which is next to impossible when you're making some of the wages that we're able to pay. Uh, but so it, it is a very a challenging issue. And these pay gaps, I just want to point out one more thing and try not to give people a headache, but uh, we have biweekly pay, which means, uh, you know, we have 26 paychecks, which span 52 weeks, seven days a week. That's 364 days. The real calendar year is 365 days. And then every four years, we have leap year, which is 366 days, uh, because it takes Earth uh, you know, 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. But, but what that means, and what I'm like, we're starting to look now many years into the future, uh, you fall behind. You've got this, you're paying people based on 364 days a year, but the real year is 365. So, you know, seven to 14 years go by, and you create this, you, this gap. Uh, well, you know, I'll bring back more on that later, but <laughs> it's... it's it's frustrating. I understand everyone wants to make everybody happy, and uh, we're just having a hard time doing that. Mr. Shaw, I want to speak, but I want to ask a follow-up question of you, Mr. Galileo. If you could please tell us, um, <laughs> um, what is the last date that we can start in August without affecting the payroll of any of our employees? If, if we do not want to affect any employees' pay, we would need to start no later than Wednesday, August 12th, 2020. Okay. Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, first, the legislative issue. Um, this has nothing to do with us directly because this, is, this, this particular issue impacts the legislature. For probably the last 20, 25 years, the issue in Tallahassee that the legislatures had to face was the lobbying that was being done by all of the, the, uh, the large um, amusement parks and, and providers in the uh, central part of the state that wanted to regulate when school started because they needed kids in high school to work in their parks during the summer and different times. And that led to some of the challenges that the legislature has, has faced in the past. Um, the issue of two weeks at the winter break, um, that got there partly, and I think that Mrs. McQuinn talked a little bit about it, but it went to that amount of time simply because the board at the many, many years, was under tremendous pressure to have a winter break so that people could go skiing during the winter. And if they were in school, they had to take a week off. And we still have schools that have significant absenteeism when parents make that choice to go on a skiing trip during the winter. So we picked up part of that time during the winter break. Thanksgiving, um, it, it was definitely an incentive. But there was also a major personnel issue that we had in the district that the number of employees that were taking that Wednesday and possibly Tuesday off as personal leave because they were going out of town for Thanksgiving, uh, we were ending up with huge substitute impact in the schools and um, as well as the absenteeism that everybody said. So the bottom line is we can sit here for the next four weeks and not have a calendar that's gonna make anybody happy. Um, I do have a problem that I don't think any of this conversation should even begin to have to anything at all to do with going to summer camp. There are summer camps and parents have to make a decision. If you want your kids to go to summer camp, you send them to summer camp. If you don't want them to be in summer camp, that's a decision you make as a parent. We have principals all year long 
that get uh, complaints from parents because their kids are in youth sports programs and they have a baseball tournament that's in late August or early September. They have a cross tournament that's in the spring and they want school to be off during that time because they need to be out of town for these sports events. So I don't want us to pick and choose anything on the school calendar that relates to what are really decisions that parents need to make. Uh, when we did spring break was always the debate also about trying to coordinate spring break with the colleges having their spring break times. And that was something that didn't, that didn't work. So it's a complicated issue, but somewhere along the line, we've got to have a calendar that absolutely uh, focuses on the needs of the instructional program. It may be, quite honestly, that this is a legislative issue that can be given, but there's consistency. But quite honestly, I don't think that anybody sitting in Palm Beach County should be dictating or, or indicating anything about how another county needs to run their school district because their needs in their county are really very specific um, to those counties. And, uh, you know, it's a thoughtful issue. It's something that's emotional. Uh, we represent 175,000 students, not a couple thousand students, not 500 students, not 10,000. Our representation is for the entire county and the impact. And I think Dr. Robinson's comments that she made about the needs of those families are things that we have to take into consideration. Dr. Robinson, you had a follow-up question, a comment? Uh, yeah, thank you. So just to follow through on... Mrs. Brill's suggestion and um, and Mr. Burke's comment. So the the issue is if we did that shift, it would just be the first year that people would miss their check. In subsequent years, it would it would cycle properly, right? If I'm understanding this, that's what I want. You, to your say. understanding is correct. Okay. And uh, in subsequent years, way down the line, we could have an issue regardless of what we do with the calendar just by the, the virtue of biweekly pay and that point I was trying to make about the, sun. the, the 364 <laughs> versus 365, right, right. Okay, and so, well, the other thing is um, that I, I see that the, the rules about 180 days don't appear to be as in concrete as I thought, right? It's 900 hours, or it's 180 days are the equivalent in hours. So we have, we're trying to meet the 900 hours. Okay. And that's a relatively, within the last five years or so, legislative change. Because if you go further back, there was a hard 180-day requirement. Uh, we okay. got some flexibility there. As long as you're providing instructional hours, you can set the days. You have so more are we meeting those instructional hours with, with this calendar proposal for each semester? Yes. Or is it year, the total year that we're meeting? We have to look at it for each semester, so yes. Okay. I'd just like to add, we, we are meeting those requirements. Uh, years past, we met those, and we have a little bit of buffer. We go above and beyond requirements. Previous years ago, we may have had a, a larger buffer. Right. You know, the 180 days was above and beyond. That gives you another full day of school uh, that if we have an unexpected closure due to a storm or something, we, you may recall we had latitude. We'd be shut down for a few days with a hurricane or what have you, and we'd say, look, we don't necessarily have to make up those days because we had this X number of hours above and beyond the state's requirement. Uh, that margin's getting narrower. And going from 180 to 179 days did basically erode one day of cushion that we've enjoyed in the past. Okay, and just to complete my thought here, so, uh, but the other thing, so to the idea of taking the exams before the holiday break and then essentially calling the end of the semester after the holiday break. Um, while I think that's worth consideration, it, it troubles me uh, because there's less instructional time. And while we're talking about these exams in terms of the impact on adults and on the school district and school grades, it also has an impact on the children taking them, right? And I mean, I'm just imagining when I was in med school, if I had, you know, two weeks less to cram for the test or, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm just saying we, for me, I'm going to think about those things. Um, so somehow if we were to do that, 
it to me is a budgetary impact in terms of making sure we have it. got your attention, huh, Mr. Burke? I saw you. So <laughs> it's a budgetary impact because we would need to make sure for the children who are not so fortunate to have all these other learning experiences that we in, we have investment in some creative um, learning opportunities for them before the test that's gonna impact their life, right? Um, and so it's not just about, it's not just about us and school grades and all that stuff. That's, that's, that's a reality, but I'm just looking at the children's point of view. Um, and so I just wanna make sure we keep that in mind if we end up essentially decreasing instructional time before the almighty test. If I may, we did discuss that. Um, we looked back to answer your question about the when we started August 22nd, there was the exams were given at the end of January is what happened. Okay. It was a one year. It was from what I can understand, the principals, the students, the parents despised it and it went back the next year. Mm -hmm. There's some new they found one newspaper article going back to when they created the new calendar for 2008, 2009, that that it was it was an experiment and it didn't work. Can I just follow up on that real quick? Yeah, quickly. Cause I was a parent then. <laughs> well, I'm still a parent, but I was a parent of students in the public school system then. And I, I do remember that whole, like, you can't really chill out over the holiday break, right? You got to not forget what you learned so that you can continue building before the almighty test, because the test impacts children. Ms. Whitfield and Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Okay, don't crucify me. I'm literally, we're workshopping here, so this is my brainstorm of the minute. Um, what if I just did the math on 900 divided by um, 180 and it's only five hours a day? What if we just extend the day an hour and then we could get rid of some other days? See, don't crucify. I know. Just well, an idea. Con contractually under the CTA contract, they can only work seven and a half hour duty days to do extend their duty days. Um, we would have to renegotiate that and there would be a significant cost to that but we would have more days off for them. Right. Again, we'd have to negotiate though from 196 down to wherever you are with that. Um, there's also some transportation concerns about- Days off. About not just the days off, but the bus drivers are guaranteed 182 days, so we have less days. Um, again, that's a contractual issue that you may have to impose upon the employee groups. Teachers are the same, you would be limiting their number of duty days but by increasing their minutes. Like we've heard, a lot of our teachers have second jobs, yeah. um, along with our custodials, our bus drivers. When you extend their duty day, um, it can cause some ripple effect in um, teachers being having to choose between maintaining their teaching job that they can't survive on and a secondary job. Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces to that that would take a while to negotiate and probably have to be imposed upon the units. I still think we should think about it. <laughs> I think there's some, some space there to at least, um, you know, follow it down the road and just see if it is something that could work. Mr. Shaw. Uh, just two quick things. The, the idea of doing instruction after the um, semester exams have been completed, I think if we really think about that, that poses some real serious issues for instruction and everything. So I don't think that that's a, a really a good solution. Um, also, I, I think that's all I'll say on that one. Thanks. All right. So if everybody's finished, uh, I, I just want um, my concerns are twofold. Um, I want to make sure that our pay employees don't miss a paycheck. So whatever that pay gap is, you, um, you know, w we need to make sure that we don't hurt the employees, especially the lowest paid employees. Um, and, and, and the other is that... Um, um, I don't have a concern with Veterans Day. Um, like Ms. McQuinn, I've been to programs in the schools where the kids will, if, if, for example, if my grandson was home on Veterans Day, he would be on the computer all day playing video games. He does not gonna know anything about Veterans Day. When I was in the schools, we had the veterans come in. There was programs all day. I'm sure that the superintendent could schedule a civics day on that day every year on Veterans Day so that we invite these people in and we have all kinds of programs. So the kids actually learn about the veterans in the, in the wars and the civics and all the things they need to learn about. So I have no issue with Veterans Day. 
I also have no issue with taking them back the two days before Thanksgiving. We can get rid of those. That was a gift that we gave, and sometimes you can't give the gift every year, so we take those two days back. And also the 21st and 22nd of December, people can fly out on the 23rd if they got to go visit Grandma at Christmas time, um, so we can get, th get those couple days back. So those days, in my, my opinion, are flexible. I just want to make sure we don't hurt the employees, and most importantly, we don't hurt the children. We need to have 67.5 days, I understand, uh, uh, with 67.5 hours in order for them to get the credit for the first semester. So whatever we do, we're in the business of educating the children. You know, whatever extracurricular activities they have, that's fine and dandy if we can fit it in. But the most important thing is we don't hurt their education. So we need to take into consideration two things, the kids first and the employees second, and whatever else we can do to make sure that uh, we meet the demands of the public, we'll do that. But, Mr. Superintendent, if you can work with your calendar committee and come back to this board with some recommendations that kind of takes into consideration all the comments you've heard today, and good luck with that one because they were <laughs> all over the place, uh, we would appreciate that you get back to us as soon as possible. Yes, so the her purpose for today was to present information, hear feedback from the community at large and the board. The team is prepared to go back to work with all the unions, and we will we'll bring back our best thinking, and we'll, we'll go through this again. No, ma'am. All right. Uh, oh. The calendar workshop is now adjourned. I will call the attorney client session to order, Mrs. Rico.